Okay, and here we go. So again, thanks everybody for joining us for our Palkus FY webinar series today. We are super excited to be talking with Maria Lawton, the Azorian green bean, about traditional Portuguese Christmas recipes. Uh, and I will have to say that by far, we've had the most registrants for this webinar out of all the webinars we've ever had. So I think it goes to show the interest level of people in wanting to learn some traditional Portuguese recipes for Christmas and, and other holidays. So Absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, so thanks for your time. Um, just a little bit about our presenter. Uh, Maria is an author of a uh, book, bloggy, uh, blogger, and foodie. Was <laughs> Blogging is okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, she was born in uh, San Miguel and currently lives in New Bedford. And you can find you can follow her at ozoriangreenbean.com. You can also find her books on Amazon.com, and she's also very well uh, represented on social media with YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest and my goodness woman you are a busy girl uh, maintaining all these channels. I am a busy woman. I am a busy woman. <laughs> so uh, but it's great you have some really great content then so we're really um, excited and, and thankful to have you here today. Just a quick uh, logistical item. Um, all listeners are in listen-only mode. That's really just so that there's uh, minimal background noise. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, please send it in the chat uh, module of the GoToMeeting, uh, GoToWebinar console that should be on the right side of your screen. And I'll read out all the questions to Maria. And because we have so many people this time, if we don't get to all the questions, not to worry. Maria will get your questions via uh, email, and then she can answer you directly. Um, or if you want to send us additional questions, you can send them to palkus at palkus.org. So with that, let's get started, Maria, and our first recipe yeah. is kavakas. What? what? Oh, you know what? My screen is not showing anything right now, honey. Oh, you know I, I did that whole thing, and I wasn't showing my screen. Uh, it's okay. It's all right. We still love you. It's okay, honey. Uh, you know, the, the best laid plans, right? Let me just go back. Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. I'm just going to go back real quick so we, everybody can see those beautiful slides that we had. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know, I know. Okay, so the traditional, so here's today's webinar. And here's all about our lovely presenter, all of these websites. And also, I should mention that the, a PDF of this presentation will be made available. Um, so if you don't want to write down the links, you can uh, just copy them from the PDF. Um, and if you want to ask questions, here with the, here's what the console on the right side of your screen should look like if you want to ask a question. Um, and I th we already have our question, and it's probably somebody telling me. Okay, we can see it too. Yes, thanks, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Kavakaj. Well, you know, it, thanks for having me, Angela. I really appreciate it, hon. Um, the thing with, we were talking about Christmas and for growing up, you know, Portuguese, what's on that table uh, for Christmas Eve? And it varies. And we're going to have things here that some of you might say, ah, oh, we never had that. We had this instead. But this is just things that I know that my mom would have made and we would have had at that table. And, of course, there's some things that aren't here on these slides, and that is figs and dates and um, all of these other little things that would always be at the table. But kavakish, we're going to start with kavakish, and that was a dessert that was, um, you know, I'd always hear how difficult it was to make, but it's not. It's the easiest thing. The key is the, the beating of it. You have to whip it um, at high speed for a good long time. And um, it's all there on the recipe on my, uh, on my website. That link will take you right to my website. Uh, but it is light. It's airy. It's not sweet. The only sweetness is the... Um, the uh, the topping on top of it, the sugar topping, and, uh, and so yeah, I think all of you. Would you eat these plain, or would you eat them with something, Maria? You, I love to eat it plain, and what I also love to do on the glaze, I like to put some lemon zest on it, and when I make the glaze, I make a little bit extra, so sometimes the glaze goes into... Um, if they have openings or cracks or holes in the kavakaj, it'll go in it, and it's it's perfect. For me, it's perfect. But you can put jam in it if you want to. Um, but I, I like it plain, just like that. And we would have a nice tray of that on top of the table. Okay. 
on to our next homemade lemon liqueur. Well, you know, I think all of us out there who will know that at that table you will always have liqueur. And the homemade liqueur was um, was a, is a specialty, and, and we all know we had that, and the table wouldn't be complete without it. So we know we can take any fruit and make it liqueur, infuse that, um, that hooch, that homemade um, aguardente that your dad would probably have made after he made his wine, and my mom would take over, and it would be infusing the, the lemon um, rinds, as well as orange rinds, uh, as well as mandarin or tangerine. Um, I mean, you can make, <laughs> you really can make liqueur out of anything, and we we tend to try our best to do that, um, but it's it's delicious. I mean, and of course, anyone that comes into your home, the first thing you offer them at Christmas is a glass of liqueur or a, a shot of uh, of something really wonderful. So this is again homemade liqueur. You need a few weeks to have the um, the rinds be really take over and. Um, uh, the liqueur kind of like just suck out all that great stuff, uh, the flavor and the color. Um, so it's something that you can't make all of a sudden this week and have it ready for next week for Christmas. But um, it, you can make it year-round, huh? You can make it year-round. Yeah, and then this way people can maybe plan ahead for next year. Absolutely. I usually do Christmas gifts for this. Oh, I, I make a good idea. Yeah, I start right after, um, right, I should say right before um Thanksgiving for us here in the United States, and I um, I go to Whole Foods or I make sure that it is organic citruses, so organic oranges, organic lemons, because when you're um, pulling all that out into the um, to the alcohol, you want it to be without any preservatives, without any additives, without any chemicals, without anything. So, but I start then, and by the time it's ready, I have it all in bottles and packaged and it's people love it they, they want it every year <laughs> so it's, it's a great gift that's awesome you may have to start your own line of liqueurs Zor I might have to <laughs> green, green <bean> line. <laughs> all right this is one of my favorites that I'm excited to try oh my god Angela all right so this is the scoop we all love Blasha Maria I you know when we're babies we're given that right off the bat and we mash it up for our babies with bananas, and I, and then when we're very old and gray and all that, we're still enjoying it because it dissolves really well in our mouth. We don't have to chew it if we don't have any teeth. <laughs> and so it's a type of thing where we just substitute sometimes things that are used with graham crackers or... Uh, I, sh I will be honest with you. This recipe came from my cousin, Daniela, and she, my mom would make this chocolate cream and all of that stuff, but the crust, uh, sometimes she would use the Blasha Medea, sometimes, you know, she would use the graham cracker crust, and uh, because it was just some of the, one of those things, well, my cousin Daniela goes, oh, no, anytime I see a recipe that has anything of another crust or another thing, I make it with Blasha Maria, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, do you know how many recipes are out there? Yeah. That if we put Blasha Maria as the crust base, how amazing that would be, and it just brings it up to a whole other level. Yeah. So this pie uh, was that, and I'll, this chocolate tort, I should say, because it is a tart, uh, is in my second book. So and it's the book I'm working on right now, so all of you are privy to this uh, recipe before it gets published in the book, but it's so worth it. It's delicious. I hope all of you get to try that. Yeah, we, we, can, uh, we can start to um, blush and modify a lot of different recipes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And you have carte blanche on that. You should be yeah. able to do that. I think all of us know what we're talking about. We love that cookie. And, yep. you know, it's funny how people say, well, I don't know what a Maria biscuit is. What is that? And I'm thinking, okay, you're not Portuguese. Because if you were Portuguese, you would know what a yeah. Blasha Maria is. Yeah, exactly. And so I try to say, well, you can. it's comparable with an Aru or a tea biscuit, an English oh. tea biscuit. But, you know, we all know that Blasha Maria is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
All right. These I love, and I'm excited to hear your recipe on this one. Oh, my God. So roasted chestnuts. Okay. You know, we, we were having this conversation not too long ago, and we were talking about how there are so many ways to make uh, or cook chestnuts. And I always love to hear people telling me how they make their, you know, roast their chestnuts or, or cook their chestnuts. Now, personally, I love chestnuts. It's something that my dad would do at the home because it was my mom, my dad, me, and my other, my two sisters did not care for chestnuts. Maybe they were adopted, I don't know. But they did not like chestnuts. So, needless to say, it was my dad who did it, and I always watched my dad do it. And I would be the one going with him to the store, and he taught me how to pick out chestnuts. And you don't go in with the, that scoop and pick them out and put them in a bag. You go in and you pick it out one by one. And that's exactly how um, you know I still do it to this day. And that is if you see little uh, pricks on the chestnut, you know that maybe uh, bugs have burrowed in um, into the chestnut. If you you might see mold on the chestnut, you don't want that. Uh, it has to be a smooth surface, not bumpy. If it's gone bumpy, it's gone old, and you don't want to use that. So there's all these like little things about a chestnut that it's not just buying a chestnut. But the way my dad did it, and I know some of you. Uh, I've heard microwave it, I heard some of you boil it only, I heard some of you just roast it only. Well, for me, I should say my dad, it was a combination. And that was he would, you know, cut them, like like any of them, any steps. You always have to cut it because you don't want to cook it and have it explode on you. And then he would boil it for like five, ten minutes tops. And then he would take it and put it in a... Uh, cast iron skillet, and that's the picture I have here. I just did that a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, and um, and put uh, salt on it. And I, I I apologize. He would also put salt in the water too when he boiled it. And uh, you would put the um, coarse uh, kosher salt at the bottom of the pan, and you would take those um, chestnuts that you just boiled and you toss them in that pan. And all of a sudden, the salt would kind of adhere to the chestnuts, and then you roast it for another, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And that's all. And it's not mushy as boiled. It's not too hard and dry as if just roasting. It's a wonderful combination. And I I absolutely stand by it. It's 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 a combination for me that makes it perfect. Yeah. Um, I think and I do as soon as I can I'm sorry, Angela. Oh no, sorry. I thought you were done. I was just gonna say I, the tips on how to pick out the the chestnuts are really helpful and then also um uh, the fact that you do both boiling and roasting to get that right balance, it's, uh, and it's a really great idea. I've only done them boiling uh, or in the crock pot yeah. water, so yeah, I'll try it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you need, you, once you do that, you'll go, oh my God, Maria, you're right. Your dad was right. <laughs> <laughs> As they usually are, right? They really are. Yeah, they really are. Okay, so masa oh, Okay, well, we know that at every table, in um, for any special occasion, it won't be complete unless you have uh, sweet bread on it. And I um, I made sure I wrote this down, and that's for all of you who make sweet bread or have tried making sweet bread and it hasn't come out well. And my thing is, don't give up. Please don't give up. Um, the thing with me, sweet bread was the hardest for me to learn. It took more tries and it took more failures than anything I've ever made. And what was funny in all this is I never gave up. I knew what was going to happen. Uh, but I was, I'm really good at baking bread. And so I kept thinking, you know, it's sweet bread. It's bread. It should be the same consistency in the dough. So when the dough was wet, I kept adding flour to it. And so it would make it a dense, it wouldn't rise as nice, it wouldn't be as fluffy inside. It wasn't what my mom would make until, you know, I explained it to my aunt how, you know, I'm just aggravated, this is what's going on, I haven't given up, and da, da, da. And she was like, it's because you are adding more flour. It's a wet dough. So for those of you that know how to bake bread but are struggling with sweet bread, that was the light that kind of like the light bulb that went off and I went, oh my God, I've been screwing myself. You know, I've been doing this to myself and putting more flour and just ruining the, the uh, recipe. So it is on the wet side. 
resist the urge to add more flour. And um, the recipe here I have is a good friend of mine, and her mom makes you know wonderful uh, sweet bread. And her steps are very easy to follow, and are very simple, and it's very delicious. And when I shared that on my Facebook page, I had so many people make it, and then sent me pictures of the completed um, sweetbreads, and they were all saying, "Oh my God, this is wonderful! This is just like my mom!" And uh, I, I, I love it. I love it. So uh, don't give up, ladies <laughs> or gentlemen. Um, you can do it. Just uh, hang in there and do not resist that urge to add extra flour. I think this is one of those recipes where it seems like it would be simple, but it is kind of intimidating. So maybe I know I haven't yeah. tried to make it, um, but I think now, now I will, given this uh, yeah. recipe you have here. All right. And I had a aunt. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. Okay. You had an aunt. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I also had an older. Um, See, I I just I try to get hints from like all kinds of everybody I can get a hold of, and one uh, and I stop people in supermarkets and I ask them and it's just it's you know I don't even want to go into detail, but uh and one little old lady it was so cute was at the Portuguese market and I was buying some flour and she uh, we were talking about sweet bread and she goes oh no I buy you know the what is it three roses five roses that comes from Canada because it's 5.5 pounds and it's just the right amount of flour that's you know perfect to make sweet bread so don't use the you know five pounds of regular you know American flour you want you know Canadian flour <laughs> so so for those out there and you can get your whole your hand on uh, the uh, the three roses or five roses or whatever from uh, flour from Canada try that because Whatever works, you know? It works. I mean, whatever works, guys. Whatever works. <laughs> All right. Another one of my favorites. Malasadish. Oh, malasadish. You know, I malasadish, to be honest with you, was only served in my home. And I was about three times a year. It was a special treat. And, you know, I in my Book. I have two recipes. I have this recipe here that I share on my uh, website, and then I have another one in my book that's my Aunt Inez. This one is from my Aunt uh, Lalia, and they're both wonderful. They're both light and they're airy, and they have that hint of lemon. It's just, um, you know, but we had it. It was the, the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, um, Easter, if, if that. And Christmas, those were the three times of the year. It wasn't, you know, every Saturday going to the bakery and buying a molasada. It was literally three times a year. So to me, molasada is just a very special treat for me. And since I've posted this recipe, you know, I've had a few people which I love, love when people make the recipe and then other people give hints, so that you know what I love about the community of green bean, Azorian green bean, is that. We kind of have a really group, really great group of people. I, you know, there's all these women and men that are part of it that I, some of them I've met through book signing and my book signing tour up in Canada. I met so many wonderful, beautiful people, and they all feel like they're, it's their place too, and which is a wonderful thing. And they come back and say, Maria, I tried it, but I tried it this way. And how about if you tweak it like this? It comes out better. And it, and I love that. And a couple of them that came back and I share with everybody is, you know, instead of using milk to dip my hands in the dough, which my mom would do, you know, she suggested using oil, uh, cooking oil. And it works. It's so much better than the milk, uh, hands down. And then from um, another person, they said, you know, let the dough rise in the oven with the door closed and the light on. Because you're always afraid of drafts, you're always afraid of all of these things, and by doing that, you don't worry about the drafts, and it gives that little heat from the lamp. It was like, oh my God, that's perfect. It's just like little suggestions for to make it easier. Um, so, but it's it's a wonderful dessert, and it's wonderful to have something at the table there for Christmas. So, yeah, wonderful memories. You know, it's one of those, I think we had uh, had this conversation earlier as well, that um, a lot of these foods are, may, may not be categorized just as Christmas because we tend to have 
sort of those Portuguese staples at all of the holidays, right? So the, the, the malasadas, the sweet rice, which I think we're going to talk about here in the next. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's um, I, I, there's definitely some some common themes here, and and I think uh, foods that we we're very familiar with, which is great. Um, right. and the other thing with malasadas is, like we said before, you know, we everybody calls it a little different it's depending different. on what island you're from, if you're in the mainland. Um, and depending on where you live, mm -hmm. and I have, you know, filosh, because I know that's in some of the islands as well as the mainland, they, that's what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, I know in St. Michael it's Molasadas, in other islands it's Molasadas. And then, of course, depending on where it is, it's Portuguese donuts, which, you know, okay. Uh, fried dough, yeah, but not even close, so much better, but some people call that. Yeah. And then beaver tails, they call that in Canada, they call it beaver tails. Mm -hmm. So, um I, I, that was new to me. I never had heard that before. Uh, but yeah, so no matter what, it's what you call it. I don't care what you call it. It's you know, it's delicious. That, yeah. that we can all agree on. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, here in California, we pretty much refer to them as fios, and and yeah. the pronunciation is different, right? The, uh, depending on what word you use. And then if you go to Hawaii, their malasadas are very different. Um, yes. So that's a whole other conversation about how we've... That's, uh, a, that's a whole other podcast. That's yeah. a whole other thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, I, Oops, go ahead. Good. I, you know, I added that in there for the simple fact that there would always be Peshkutch in my home. No matter when, no matter where. I had no cookies in my cookie jar. It was filled with Peshkutch. And we talked about the different designs of Peshkutch. You know, my mom would make it this way, where you'd roll it out and make a circle like a wreath or whatever, you know, and um, and sometimes she wouldn't have the patience to do that, and she would just make little balls of it, and that's fine, too, and I know we talked about having it twisted so it's almost like a ribbon. Yep. Um, it really does not matter how the design, you can use your creative juices to do whatever kind of design, but this biscuit recipe is... Um, Biscuits made with heavy cream, and that was always one of my favorites. And um, and you would you would have that at Christmas. You would have that all the time uh, because you would have that uh, in the afternoon with some tea, or you'd have it before you go to bed with some tea. Or if you didn't want to feel like having t something too too sweet, you'd have a biscuit uh, with your coffee at night. So it's just it's something that's just always there. And uh, it still is to this day. Yeah, and speaking of tea, just a total side note, something that I learned from you um, was that the English got their tea tradition from the Portuguese. So I love that. And so this is a perfect uh, compliment to You're that. You're darn right. You're darn right. <laughs> it was uh, Queen Catherine who was married off to King Charles in England. And with it went a big uh, trunk of tea as well as... Um, for a wedding gift, um, they were given the tea route uh, to India. Uh, that came from Portugal as a wedding gift. And when um, the queen came into the court, uh, she introduced afternoon tea time. And that tradition stuck on. But it was brought on, that tradition came from a Portuguese queen. So for all of us who are Portuguese, we can say to our English friends, you can thank us for tea time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because people think of it as very much an English tradition, but yeah. what do they know? Yep. Uh huh. Excellent. And, and who has the only tea plantation in all of Europe? Oh, the Azores. the Azores, yeah. That's right. We and that, that's a whole other time. That's a whole All other right. time. To talk. Another podcast. <laughs> Another podcast. <laughs> okay, sweet oh, rice. Sweet rice. Oh my God. Well, you know that's my favorite one. It's my favorite dessert of all time. I, I think everyone knows that by now. Uh, anyone who follows me on Facebook knows that sweet rice is my favorite of all time. I'm like the connoisseur of sweet rice. Whoever has sweet rice, I have to go straight to it and taste it and see how it's made. If I like it, how I've got to get the whole thing down. And in my book, I don't have one recipe. I have three um, because I love them all three. They're all three different consistencies. Some people like it, like my dad where you can cut it and hold it in your hand. No word of a lie. It's that, you know, that dense. And then my uh, cousin Loriana, it's um, a little bit uh, softer and a little bit creamier 
but not too creamy. And then it's my Aunt Lalia's recipe, which is the creamiest by far. And, you know, there's a stick of butter in it. There's more milk. There's, I mean, it just, it's so decadent. And that, like I said, by far it is the creamiest. It's the most delicious. And um, so, yeah, this is the recipe I share with everyone here. And that is my Aunt Lalia's. You have a you have another good tip here at the end about um, not just putting the egg yolks into the rice, or else you'll get scrambled oh. egg. So well, you know, it's it's a science that you again you learn by going. Oh my God, I have egg <laughs> cooked egg in my <laughs> rice pot. <laughs> so you know, and so I try, I try to make it so that all of you won't have to go through the same mistakes I had to go through. And it's a simple step, but no one ever talks about it. When they give you the recipe, they just tell you, and you add the eggs, you know. Mm -hmm. and you go, okay, you add the eggs, and then you add it, and you go, what the heck did I just do? <laughs> so you have to temper it. You have to temper your eggs. And the same way when you make kanja and you add your eggs, your egg yolks in it, it's the same thing. And that is you take, you know, a, a nice uh, amount of a, good, a nice little bowl amount of the rice pudding. You add the eggs to that. And then you take that bowl that's been tempered with the egg and you add that into the, the pan because that way it'll, you know, again, it'll make it creamier uh, and it'll add color. Those are the only two reasons to add the eggs in it. Got it. Um, for those people that went, oh, I really don't want to add the egg, fine. It'll just be a lighter color mm -hmm. on your pudding, on your rice pudding. And it won't be as creamy. But if that's not what you wanted to begin with, that works out fine. There's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. I think that's such a big thing. And it could be with all types of ethnic cooking, but especially with Portuguese, because everybody has their own version of things, right? And so sometimes you'll make something and someone will say, well, you didn't make it the right way. But to your point, right. it's not that it was right or wrong. That's just how I prefer it. So, Correct. Um, you know. And not only that, but we know that from uh, Portuguese cooking, it's different from the islands, the Azorean islands. Mm -hmm. They cook different from the mainland. Mm -hmm. In the islands, island to island, they cook different, as well as village sometimes to village in each island, they cook yeah. differently. Yeah. And, you know, uh, with techniques and spices and all of that stuff. Then you go to the mainland and you do. You have your, your sea coast and you have your the ones that are up in the mountains. Those are two different ways of cooking, yeah. the spices and all of that. Yep. And then you don't even want to go into Brazil. We, I mean, that's a whole other Portuguese <laughs> uh, way of cooking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you've got Macanese, which is Macau, Portuguese cooking mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, China. And then you've got Goa in India that they still speak Portuguese and cook, um, you know, uh, with our spices and all the things that we brought into Portugal, you know, we, yeah. Portuguese we, we is the original Maveda. cook. I'm sorry? So we can't forget Madeira. Oh, and Madeira. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry for those that are from Madeira. I'm sorry. Um, you are correct. It's a whole archipelago of islands there, too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and the thing is, is on, um, we were, the Portuguese were the original fusion cooking. <laughs> I like that. We were doing spices from all different places and introducing and, you know, we introduced tempura. We did all the, um, the spicing, the curry and all of that. The, the uh, what is it we say, um, uh, well, that's the same way that they do in, uh, in India, but they call it a different, it's like a different twist. But huh. they cook the thing Dutch. It's the same way. It's we are the most amazing nationality, and I just you know we really have to be proud of who we are and what we've introduced to the world. And uh, we were discoverers. We were um, these amazing um, you know brave people, and uh, who traveled the world and and brought ourselves to different places, and um, it's just, I, I, you know, I, that's a whole other podcast, Angela, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, I, I think we were truly the, the first fusion cooking, and anytime I hear someone saying, oh, farm to table, farm to table, I'm like, big deal, that's what I grew up with, Right, exactly. you know, farm to table is nothing new, yeah, you know? we were eating organic before it had a name, right, 
Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> kale. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. Welcome to my world. We've been yeah. using kale for a long time. Yeah. You know, it's just all of these things that, um, you know, we we really we really are just wonderful. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Um, so we have a few other Christmas recipes here that they aren't yes, on your yes. website, but uh, from our friends at other other places that uh, yes. people might think of when they think of Portuguese Christmas foods. Yeah, well, you know, I I love David, and I'm so glad we were able to share some of his recipes here because my mom would huh, it was very rare she would make a boule a uh, boule de ré. Uh, that would be something that, um, first of all, my dad did not care for crystallized fruit, so uh, that would tend to be uh, something she would not uh, make, but she would buy. That's the, and there's the difference. She would go to the baker. I have someone that she knew that would make it and have it. So I didn't want to say, oh, this is the recipe of my mom, because I, I don't have one. My mom would not make it. What she would make instead, and I found it in... Um, would be called the boule de natal and this one is it's a very regional one uh, where this is the ones that you would make and you would have uh, it's our fruit cake our christmas fruit cake but instead of the crystallized fruit that's in that recipe and that one comes as close to my mom as ever she would substitute the crystallized fruit for dates for figs in addition to um, the white, the golden raisins, and the uh, regular raisins. So, and and omitted the crystallized fruit because that was the uh, again, not a a liked thing at my home. And the sunge, um, you know, that again, that's something she would make malasada. She wouldn't make sunge. And uh, last is also chabadish, which is some people call it chabadish, some people call it uh, fetiyah de radish, and the golden slices. And that's what, um, you know, my mom would call it, would be fetiyaj de radish. And, uh, and I think I explained it to someone the other day. It's, you know, we deep fry ours. You know, we use day-old bread and we dredge it in um, a mixture of the eggs with sugar. And, um, you know, sometimes she would throw a little bit of vanilla in there. Sometimes she would put cinnamon in there. And, um, and then she would deep fry it and then dredge it through the sugar or sometimes um, cinnamon. So, but everyone makes it a little different again, you know, um, but it's all wonderful things that would be at that table. Uh, just a reminder uh, to our, our listeners, you can submit a question anytime. Um, you don't have to wait till the end. So, um, and we, we're doing well on time. We're only at about 8.33. So we have uh, a good, uh, you know. I know, 20, you know, it's funny. Uh, we're going to be honest here. We were talking about this, and um, you know, Angela and I were talking, and we went through what we wanted to say, and no word of a lie. We were talking for almost two hours, yeah. and 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 so we said, "Oh my God, I can't do this. I can't talk for two hours. We only have an hour's time." So I tried going as fast as I could in describing different things, and now we've got plenty of time. Fine, right? So, um, you know, but that's okay. That's all right. You know, this. I think this. Um, this time of year is very close to all our hearts. It's a time when, for some people, it's very difficult uh, because they've lost their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so traditions are very important, and especially food traditions, mm -hmm. because our strongest memories that we have is food memories. And so then when we have Christmas and that table is set up or we're cooking or we're baking and we're making all of these wonderful dishes you know the thought goes back to when you were a child when you were growing up when your mom would make that when your grandmother would make it what else was on that table you know there was codfish on that table okay. that's that's a, that's a whole other thing I mean we're talking about sweets that are on that table but we know that we'd have codfish. And I know some people use the, the codfish agumjtsa. Other ones use, uh, you know, the different layers of boiling codfish with potatoes and the egg and having that there on the table. My mom would fry up um, codfish cakes, you know, the shtortish. And so that was something where, again, she would make that, or sometimes she would make the little balls, 
of the croquettes mm-hmm. of uh, codfish, and we'd have that to just like pop in our mouth. And I love it with a squeeze of lemon over it. It that just mm-hmm. always is a wonderful thing. Whereas mm-hmm. my dad would always want a little hot sauce next to the side to make it even spicier. <laughs> you know, just all of those wonderful um, memories that come from that table. And you know you'd have lupini beans. You'd have tomos on top of that oh, yeah. table. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'd have your wine. My for my home, my it would be my dad's homemade wine, because my dad was very proud of his homemade wine. He would make it every year, and every year he would have his new uh, his new vintage, and he made sure that everybody, you know, who would come in, uh, would have it. And besides the liqueur, and you know, there was. The midnight mass that would go with it, or Misa Dugal, mm-hmm. that we'd call it, and you'd come back home and you'd have all of that set up, and um, you know, and it's hard to explain to non-Portuguese people that we celebrate our Christmas, Christmas Eve. Right. Uh, you know, it's all of that was, you know, going to Christmas mass, getting everything cooked and ready so that when we come back home, everything would be on that table. Yeah, that was number one. And so we'd go to Midnight Mass, we'd come back, we'd have all of the food there to celebrate. We'd open gifts. Uh, sometimes before we'd open gifts, we would have people at our door singing, playing music, and they're going house to house, um, or family to family, friends to friends, and uh, you know, asking for that shot of liqueur, homemade liqueur, yep. and uh, it it was just a really wonderful, wonderful time that I think now those things aren't as done as much here in the United States. I think it's, it, I know it's still done in Portugal. I know it's yep. still done in Portugal, as well as the Azores. I know it's done, um, but around here, those, that time is, like they don't, we don't do that anymore. You yeah. know, it's in fact. I think in our previous conversation, I was saying that uh, you know the first time I ever went door to door singing the Christmas carols for Christmas time was in Portugal because here in California, we're really spread out. So to go door to door, you actually have to drive door to door. Right. So we never did that. At least uh, not in the community I grew up. There could could be other uh, communities and other cities where they've done it, but. Uh, yeah, we're we're just so much more spread out over here that I think some of those small village traditions, um, yeah, they went away as soon as you, you came. They did. And my uh, my I have two older sisters, and both Isabel and Adeline married two brothers. Hmm. So yeah, it's kind of it, so the family. Uh, my brother-in-law's family is a huge part of my family because they've always been part of my family. Right. My sisters are married to the same, you know what I mean, the same family. They're not only sisters, they're also sister-in-laws <laughs> to each, you know what I mean, to all of the other, it's kind of, but, so my nieces and nephews are as close to being cousins as well as, you know, as close to siblings as you could ever be. And, but their, uh, they were, their family was um, from Pufasal, which is in St. Michael. And let me tell you, they put my family to shame when it came to partying. <laughs> they did. And I loved every minute of it because, you know, uh, you know, Jose would have a guitar, you know, um, Francis Frank would have an accordion. Um, you know, his, their mom would have, you know, a, a little tambourine. It was like, it was just so much fun. And because here in New England, um, you know, we all kind of um, immigrated into, you know, whether you're in New Bedford and you're in, within this certain south end, north end kind of thing, you, you stayed in clusters. Right. As well as in Fall River, again, there's clusters of us. And so all our family and friends were just a block here, a block there, a block here, a block there. So it was literally, let's go. Mm-hmm. And... It, and it was going door to door, and you know, you'd say, you know, Ninja Zuzmisha, and you would, they would go, yes, it would be, you know, and they'd give you a drink, and you know, and this isn't me in my teenage years. I'm going in and having shots, you know, yeah. it's just I'm like, oh my god, it, 
just, it was so much fun. It was just so much Good fun. Good memories. So we do have a question. Um, okay. Someone says they love the little custard pies while they were in Horta, uh, and there are different recipes all around. What is your recipe? So I'm thinking maybe queijadas or the uh, pastels nata maybe? It would be the pastels de nata. Okay. Because... And what would happen, I know my aunt, that'll be in book two, hon, that'll be in book two. My aunt Laudia makes, instead of doing the little queijada, she does it in a tart. Um, and it is just simply delicious. And she also has two recipes for the custard tarts. For not the filling, but the outside crust. Oh. And de depending on where you go for it, it could either be a flaky... Um, uh, like phyllo dough kind yeah. of uh, consistency puff, not phyllo, uh, more puff okay. pastry, I'm sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. versus a uh, almost like a pie dough, but it's not, it's a little thinner, yeah. but it's a little bit more, so there's the two different um, pie doughs, and I have recipes to make both, but I'll be very honest with you, I have the recipe for it, but when I've experimented in making it, I use the store bought you know <laughs> I'm gonna be very honest here because it, I can make the puff pastry from scratch but it is very time-consuming and if you want to do that absolutely uh, but Pillsbury as well as another brand that I love um, makes amazing puff pastry and the key on the pastry the shell is you take that sheet of pie pastry I mean I'm sorry, I'm sorry of puff pastry and you roll it. You just roll it all together. Hmm. And once you roll it, now you're going to cut slices of it. And those little slices, you're going to work it to form and go into that, um, to the cupcake uh, tin. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, your uh, pastry on that queijada de nata is going to be so much flakier than uh, you would by just cutting it and putting it in the, you know, in the pan. And stuff. Right, right. That's the key. The key is that rolling that puff pastry for the base of it and then cutting it and then working it uh, together and putting it into the, um, the, the pan itself. But the, um, the inside, um, there's different versions. Some people put lemon in it. Some people put vanilla in it. Some people don't put any of that in it. There's uh, a little bit of everything. Um, and, and they're right. In, in Horta, they would make it differently than they would make it in St. Michael, as well as, you know, the ones in the mainland, which is all in itself a whole different thing. I mean, you know, people say, oh, it's like, you know, because others are lamb. No, it isn't. No, no, yeah. no. Different. No, they're different. <laughs> They have their own, which is amazing. It's a secret recipe. You can try to replicate it, but it's it. You can't even touch it. You can't. <laughs> so um. we, have, we have another question. Um, when in Horta we had a pastry made with beans. They were delicious. Do you have a recipe? Oh, for beans? I do. I do. That's book two. I have my <laughs> bean cards. And you know what? Uh, it, and this is funny because when I did book one. I um I did like all of the things that I wanted my daughters to remember the ones that you know things that I didn't want to forget you know make sure because you you know again I wrote the book for my my three daughters and my nieces and nephews not to ever forget you know mm -hmm. and uh, and to remember things that my mom and you know my family did and all that but it wasn't complete and I knew there would be a second book and so the second book I thought well I'm gonna do desserts. Because, you know, there's so many desserts because every recipe that I have, I have like four or five desserts. And we all we all have a sweet tooth. I have to say that. I think for anything, we always at the very end, it doesn't have to be like, oh, my God, you know, a, a truckload of sweets. But we like to have that little sweetness, that little treat at the end. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I was going to do that. But then I get so many other people requesting going, Oh, you didn't put your octopus recipe in there. We don't want our <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need to put octopus in there. And in the meantime, I've made this wonderful roasted octopus that's like amazing. Um, and the same thing with the bean tarts. And there's, uh, I have a couple of recipes for bean tarts. And one of them is with a um, with a base 
that's uh, almost like a pie, but it's not. It's um, like a pie dough, but it's very thin uh, crust on it, mm. as well as one that doesn't have a crust. And and some people like to use the red beans, um, so it almost like a brownish color. And some people like to use the white beans, which that was my mom's favorite. She liked the white beans, mm. and it would make it almost, and it would caramelize on the top. It, oh, wow. it, it was delicious. But that's in the second book, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's in the second book. I, sh I share a lot of things that are coming out from the second book, but, you know, I not everything, guys. Yeah, I'm sorry. yeah. no worries. There's the, we'll just have to make, do more webinars with more recipes. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a few more slides, um, and this one I know we talked we talked a lot about tradition, so it's not a food tradition, but certainly a Christmas tradition. Oops. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna try and mute myself, and you can go ahead and talk about the preserve. Okay. Um, well, you know, guys, for me, growing up, um, as with like I said before, you know, Christmas was huge in my family. You know, and my parents love to decorate. And especially my mom, uh, my dad would, um, you know, bring in these uh, huge um, branches from trees, moss from outside, and they would make this elaborate pizzap. Um, and it's something that I always uh, admired. I would always, I would spend hours looking at it as a child and imagining the village and imagining all the, the scenery that they would put together. So it was always um, very you know, theatrical, let's put it that way, um, for us to look at that and to see it and um, and create our own little uh, version of what the village would look like around the manger. And so when my, you know, my parents passed, you know, my, I was the one who, um, from my sisters, who inherited the, um, my mom's Prezap. And, because it really was my mom's Prezap. She, she loved every little figurine and would know where it came from and, and all of that stuff. And and now I have it. And it's a tradition that I carry on every year. I set it up uh, for my daughters who have been raised, um, you know, with this. And they make sure that every year I have it set up because they ask for it. They want to have it there. And, uh, and you know, it's something that I know my parents, like I said, my parents would love knowing. Um, that that tradition continues and that one day when I'm gone, you know, my daughters will continue with that. And um, it's just, um, you know, it's a tradition that still goes on in, in the Azores and Portugal. And um, and it's something that, again, we cannot, um, we can't forget about that. It's something that we need to uh, hold on and uh, and pass on. So it's, it's really important. Um, you know, I just... Uh, Every year now that my family in Portugal knows that I uh, that I have this, uh, every year I get a piece or two added on uh, f as gifts from them. Oh, that's and, cool. and last year I uh, I received the windmill. That was the big. That was my gift last year. Was the windmill. That's awesome. And and it was like, oh my God, okay, I can, I've got a windmill, but I know I had someone that had a fish at the end who was fishing, so I had to make, you know, get a little mirror and make it so that it's, uh, you know, it looks like the water reflecting and the fish coming out of it, and then stones, and you know, so I, I'm not as elaborate as my mom, mom and dad would be, but I try, I really try to try to do it. Well, I was always, um, I always wondered how people collect or amass all of the different figurines because you can't just go out and buy. A full set like that, right? You can buy the nativity scene, but the whole village and all the other little figurines, I always wondered, how long does it take to pull all that together? And some people hand yeah. make them. We have a couple of people here in California that um, they're known for their preserves that take up almost a whole room. <laughs> and they. And that's exactly how my mom and dad would have been. And when it was in St. Michael, it was uh, the dining room. It was the whole wall, and it came out of that. And it was three live trees, and it was, wow. uh, you know, it was huge. It was a huge production. And so when we immigrated over here, uh, my mom was only able to bring so much of it with her. So the pieces that she had were her favorite pieces. Mm -hmm. And so it, it means a lot to me knowing that those were her favorite pieces. You sure. know? And, uh, and when we, uh, my, co my cousin, especially my cousin, Drummond Well, 
and his family, they do it still where it's a whole room. It's a whole room. <laughs> it, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. And they have like one, they have like running water. Oh, like, my what? gosh. You know, it's like running water. It's like a little fountain and stuff. I'm like, what? It's just, it's crazy. It, they, it's really elaborate stuff. Really yeah. elaborate. I'm happy with my Pazap. I am very yeah. happy with it. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to, that we have some pictures of it to share. Well, may, maybe it'll inspire some of us to uh, expand on our nativity scenes and start to do a full <laughs> full display. Um, so right. Our final slide here is uh, about your new PBS series that you're working on, which we're really excited about because um, I, I know it's not going to be just in Rhode Island. It's actually going to be syndicated nationally, so we all get to enjoy. Absolutely. I, You know, it's Working with PBS Rhode Island um, is just been great. You know, they uh, they saw that you know there is no Portuguese food on PBS. Um, period. There's there's no representation of our food, mm -hmm. and um, so they asked me to do a pilot for them. So I, with friends of mine, uh, we went to St. Michael and filmed there, as well as we used a test kitchen here in the town of Dartmouth um, and we you know filmed this amazing pilot a 30-minute pilot and um, gave it to PBS Rhode Island and they saw it and they loved it and it's really wonderful to have people go oh my god that's you know that was beautiful uh, the scenery, is, where was that? You know, is that, that's in St. Michael. Oh my God, you know, that's so beautiful. And, and this is how it's made and our food and this and that. And, and they gave me a letter of intent, which is saying, uh, you film and, and you create 12 more shows and we will air it. Um, and it's, and now, because it is PBS and it's a nonprofit, it, this isn't the Food Network or the Cooking Channel. Um, the you've got to look for the sponsors. You've got to look for underwriters to pay for the filming, the editing. Um, Maria Lawton does not get paid. <laughs> this is all money for uh, to to air it, to film it, to film it. And to edit it, and to it's a it's a lot of money to do that. Mm -hmm. So right now we're looking for um, you know underwriters and sponsors to make that happen. And um, so if there's companies, organizations um, that are out there that are hearing this and they want to be part of it and be on that list of you know this series is brought to you and made possible because of um, you know people like you know, and thanks to, um, you know, have their name on that. That would be um, that would be a wonderful thing if they're able to do that. Well, sure. So yeah, so we're looking we're looking for sponsors and underwriters. So uh, if everyone tells two friends and two friends tell two friends, and it continues, you know, this could be this could be done next year. Um, and I I really I see it happening. I see PBS um, having a Portuguese food uh, cooking series on. It's time is due. Um, we are. Um, we really have not shown who we are out there in the cooking world, and I think it's time. It, the time has come, and um, I, I, I really do. And the other thing I know that Angela and I were talking about is uh, doing, you know, other things out there and getting the word out about Portuguese food and being Portuguese and. Um, you know, there's so many of us, but we tend to be, you know, we acclimated very well mm -hmm. uh, into our surroundings, and we came in and we held on to some traditions with family, and um, and but we also acclimated, and um, we didn't put our food in the forefront. Um, I know my parents, you know, my mom was the most amazing cook, but. You know, my dad would rather, rather eat at home <laughs> and have my mom's cooking than go into a restaurant. You yeah. know, it was a type of thing where, you know, it's it's our food. You know, of course it's it's wonderful. Right. But, you know, and when I do go to certain Portuguese restaurants, there's some that are spot on and they're wonderful. And then there's some that you go, well, okay, they've Americanized it. Um, you know, so it's it's important to to kind of show who who we are and what our food is made of. 
Right. No, I absolutely agree. And going back to the sponsors, you know, if a, um, a linguista sponsor, food sponsor, olive oil sponsor, you know, that's a perfect way to get their their product to be used on the show also, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, um, and at least to, be, uh, to notify, who, you know, this is, it's not, it brought to you by, you know, such as a sausage company. Oh, which sausage company is that? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Right. Um, no, PBS does not allow um, certain commercials. Uh, you can't really do commercials per se mm -hmm. because it's a nonprofit. It's all once someone wants to be a sponsor or wants to be an underwriter, there's uh, you know it has to go through PBS for them to approve it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole um, series to it, but it's because it's a public broadcasting system. It's right. um, and there's some rules and regulations that need to go by, right. but um, we need to make it happen, folks. Sure. We need to make it happen. I agree. So we are <clears throat> at just at four minutes to the hour, so we did a great job of sticking to our hour. And we Yay! have one final question, which is, when will your new book be released? Oh, my God. So I was just telling um, uh, Angela, I, um, I have, uh, I'm going into New York uh, next month, and um, in talking to some, <laughs> some people, but I'm, I'm hoping it's next year. I'm hoping it's next year. Um, yeah, as soon as I, as soon as I have that, I will absolutely let you know, but it'll be, I'm, I'm hoping next year. Let's keep our fingers crossed for next year. Fingers um, crossed. yeah. And, uh, you know, it's going to be in a continuation of book one where it's going to be a lot more recipes and a lot more desserts. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's almost like the, the missing piece to mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And then the third can be just desserts and maybe the fourth can be a little bit about every island or maybe the third will be about all the recipes from the different islands including Madeira and going into the continent and, and all of that so you know um, I'm, I'm gonna keep writing I'm gonna keep writing that's awesome I'm just, yeah it, I'm just gonna keep writing and I'm gonna keep sharing and I think the more of us share and um, with each other the more we know it will continue Mm -hmm. It will be lost in translation as well as with someone passing with this amazing recipe that they never shared with their family. I mean, and they took it to their grave. I mean, how good is that? Really? Right. You know, let's share with each other. Exactly. Uh, we need to do that. Yes, I know you make the most amazing bakalaku natish, but you know what? It would be wonderful to give it to your daughter. <laughs> Sure. Yep. Or give it to your niece or your cousin or pass it on. I mean, yeah. you can't take it with you guys. You can't take it with you. Uh, you got to pass it on. You got to keep, if you want to keep it within family, keep it within family. But you got to share it. You got to share it with family because once you go, that's it. Yep. That's it. Agreed. And it goes with you. Agreed. And with that, uh, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you again, Maria. This has been so awesome. And I think that we are going to be doing a lot more with you because <clears throat> there's so much to be talked about and so many recipes to, to share. Um, so this is just the first of many uh, for us. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you um, for having me. I, re I really our, appreciate it. Our pleasure. Um, all webinars of the, you know, through this series are posted on our website, and you can go and view them anytime. They're also on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel. And also on the website, uh, PDFs of all presentations are posted, so you can always download the, the PowerPoint and, um, and, and look at it that way if you didn't want to watch the video. But please consider this a resource to share with your fam family and friends, and you can watch any time. And with that, we thank you for your time. Thank you for attending, and hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Han. Talk right. to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.